and welcome to Mindscapes, a series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is a painter, and like many successful painters, her work has been exhibited in galleries around the world and is part of private and public collections uh, in India, Europe, Japan, and the museums and galleries in, in, in many parts of the world. But what distinguishes her is her unique commitment and a combination of both the personal vision and articulation and the public art. To many, she's regarded in the tradition, the lineage, as it were, of uh, Amrita Shergil, the legend. But my guest is emerging as somewhat of a legend in her own right. I'm delighted to welcome Arpana Kaur. Thank you, Raji, for those wonderful compliments. Thank my you. goodness. Uh, well, yeah. it's, um, I think that um, uh, you have embodied uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a contemporary world of painting uh, a, a, a deep sense of uh, introversion, introspection, uh, a, a, a private artist in, in, in many ways, uh, and yet you have engaged in many public works. Um, do you see yourself uh, in, 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 in what role? Uh, do you see yourself as, as, as someone engaging in the, in the processes of art for yourself uh, personally, which is really the image that I've traditionally had of uh, you and your work, uh, and, and, and making these forays out recently, uh, we haven't traditionally associated you uh, with the with the more sort of how do I put it uh, uh, the, the publicity seeking aspect of the art world. Uh, it's, it's very much someone who's engaging in your own processes. What is your self perception? Um, well, I think the introverted part is a pain for me. It's something I've been trying to overcome unsuccessfully for many many years and see myself improving just a little. But uh, the introverted nature of one's temperament is, uh, uh, to my mind, something I've had to combat with. And, uh, uh, you know, because at a certain point of your life, you are called upon to move also in more public spheres. And then you have to combat uh, that. And I feel that I'm much better now than I was um, many, many years ago when I used to have a permanent chair in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And if any visitor came into the house, which was very rarely, I would have this retreat and a book and I'd wait for sounds of the visitor to leave and come out. And I'm still intensely private. Um, uh, I have a recording machine, for instance, and uh, you know, just hear messages twice or thrice a day. And uh, um, the contradiction is that the work is about people. Uh, but I live in a city like Delhi, which has become very uh, active and uh, can really have a great weight upon you if you were not to shut yourself up to do your creative work. Because painting, unlike the kind of work that you do, is a very private um, uh, thing and uh, when you are sitting in front of the canvas you are like a monk uh, and it's just you and the canvas and even the rustle of somebody opening an envelope or listening to a phone call could disturb you. So um, it's an intensely private activity. What happens to painting after it's done is not in your hands because then the galleries take over. The necessity of having occasional shows, although I show once in five years, even in Delhi, uh, takes over. And other paraphernalia to do with painting, uh, for instance, there's somebody coming from Meera tomorrow for a dissertation, somebody coming from Aligarh next week for a dissertation. So these activities take over once the painting act is over. But for that act, you have to give the best part of your day. And then you have to shut yourself up and be in inaccessible to the world, which I managed to do very successfully by lying, by this wonderful instrument called a recording machine. And uh, the uh, aspect of exhibiting is when you are out in the open and totally vulnerable, because um, when a painter is exhibiting, then you are totally, uh, you know, you your thoughts, your feelings are there for all to see. And that's a moment you have to face from time to time. Um, 
how I had balanced it was having the shows at very long intervals in between. And the public art, which we just talked about, is out of a feeling that um, you know, very few people come into galleries to look at. Um, I should just painting. simply explain that mm. the uh, that the public art is that uh, you have done um, created murals in public spaces uh, in Delhi mm. in, in Germany and and and. Uh, this is really taking art out of the galleries uh, into, um, in, into the public sphere where it's both accessible and, and, and viewable, uh, not just by uh, people who formally seek out art, but as a part of the, of the landscape. And that's, that's a sort of new area uh, that you've been reaching area. out to. In fact, that's an area that I forged into 21 years ago when I did two murals for the India International Trade Fair in Delhi. But because paintings weren't selling, and in those days, Delhi had, in the 70s, two galleries, Dhimi Mal and, you know, Sridharani or IFX, which you could rent out, or Rabindra Bhavan, but private galleries, there were only two. So what did artists do for a living? They either taught or they sought public work of the kind the trade fairs offered. People like Narayan Kulkarni, K.S. Kulkarni, and so many other artists would send in tenders. And I also sent in tenders for Goa and Himachal in 1980 just to make some money and I worked on site for two months and produced these two pavilions which were temporary. How does a, 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 a piece of art like that which is a collaborative enterprise yeah. uh, emerge? You know, your, your work is so intensely personal. How do you go out and work with someone else to create a new totality? It's two different minds operating. Um, do you it plan it in advance? It sort of evolves as it goes along? Do you do little bits and segments? How do you make this mesh? Uh, you know, it's a much more difficult exercise and therefore challenging. Everybody wants to get out of what they've been doing mm -hmm. normally. Although I love the solitude of my studio, but there are times when you want to try a uncharted territory, which is this kind of collaborative work. And I embarked on this about seven years back with a folk artist called Satnarayan Pandey from Bihar, who is a Godna painter. Our Godna was totally unknown. Uh, it means tattoo. And tattoo is always done on the body. And black and white tattoo painting from the Madhubani district. Now, Madhubani is very well known. It's flamboyant and loud. But Godna is very subtle and black and white. And when paper went to this part of Bihar, Ten years back, the Godna artists felt that it's a chance of making a little bit of money, although the money is hardly there. But they felt, okay, let's explore a market. So they began to coat cow dung with water mm -hmm. and coating the paper and doing the black and white drawings on it. So this Godna painting was completely unknown till I chanced upon this artist sitting on a pavement near Delhi Heart. He hadn't got a place in Delhi Heart. He never got access to the Crafts Museum. So I said to myself that we live in two times and two cultures simultaneously. And there's a thermal power station behind my house where all the women of Shapur Jat village dry thousands of dung cakes every day on its steel walls. And um, I go to an ashram in Ghaziabad every week where I see the most strange sights uh, of, say, a bullock cart carrying the upper body of a truck on the Delhi Ghaziabad. Highway, and I thought how to show these two coexistences in a painting it would be to collaborate with a folk artist. Well, nobody had ever co-signed with a folk artist. I mean, there's, they are respected in their own way, but they don't sign their work because in India we never had this tradition of signing, like Ajanta, Lora, or even the miniatures are all unsigned. So the tradition of the anonymity. Uh, the dedicated artist individuality is a very 20th century phenomena. So Pandey also used to never sign his paintings. So when I started working with him, so I requested him to do rows of horses in our first collaborative work, which were horizontal. And I juxtaposed that with the vertical line of cars in all these fluorescent garish colors that cars come in, and we called it so many horsepower. So I was very thrilled with the outcome of this horizontal linear tension and the horse car tension. And I mean, it was very naive and simplistic, but it was the reality of our times. Similarly, I made him do trees uh, and leave space for me to do a garden or chairs 
and we called it the same wood because from the same innocent tree is coming the chair which now in Delhi especially we know what the chair means Kissa Kursi Ka so I had this row of very uncertain chairs parallel to the trunk of the tree in fluorescent colors again and the fact that his work was black and white gave me a chance to juxtapose my loud um, you know primary colors which I'm very fond of using and the gun again comes from the same wood so this whole thing of violence uh, you know nature being used for fashioning a weapon to kill the quality too of your painting in terms of the uh, the women in your paintings uh, there, there is sort of almost a, a, a diminished sexuality or there isn't a focus on that aspect of it uh, um, men are, are almost sort of marginal uh, in, 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 in the canvas um, how do you look at what are your notions of feminism no, firstly, I don't regard myself as a feminist uh -huh. or any East uh -huh. or any Isn't uh -huh. because I find straight jackets very mm -hmm. confining. Mm -hmm. um, but in the beginning, when I began to show in '74, mm -hmm. uh, things were different for women, mm -hmm. and one was growing up. You know, as a teenager, mm -hmm. painting was a way of exploring self-identity. Mm -hmm. Who am I? What's my role in life? What gives me happiness? What am I to follow? These were questions one had to discover and I chose to discover them through painting. Therefore, the autobiographical element uh, and I did a lot of works called Women in Interiors and often the Women in Interiors were juxtaposed with a male kite flyer who has all the freedom to move around in. This was the 70s. But slowly, as you're surer of your identity, I think it was some very great writer, Hindi writer, I can't recollect her name, who said it's not me who creates the writing, it's writing that creates me. So in the case of creative people, I think musicians, you must be experiencing it yourself. But it's your work which fashions you, you know, chisels you day by day. And um, uh, the autobiographical element, which was a necessity in those days of exploration, of identity. When, once one was on shared ground um, as a person, as an artist, so one became um, uh, aware of the world and universal issues like, say, environment or even spiritualism. Uh, although in these cynical times one uses that word with great hesitation because even the word Sufi has become so fashionable in Delhi these days and I find it so skin deep now. So I'm afraid to use that word, although I was brought up with this whole tradition of Bilisha and Farid and Kabir and uh, did a whole series on Kabir also, Body is Just a Garment. But one is afraid now of using that word. To what degree is this sort of uh, the, the, the external analysis of, of, of art critics mm -hmm. and reviewers and writers uh, about you? Uh, a, a pressure, a, a liability uh, in some ways. You know, you're, you're analyzed, you're, 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 you're dissected, you're uh, applauded. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, she, she's working in, in, in the lineage of uh, uh, Amrita Shergill, she's emerging as a legend, da 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 da. There's a whole yeah. range of things that people say about your work, uh, which in a sense, uh, uh, for, for someone who responds to your work, you. is, is more, um, how do I put it, uh, uh, more a hindrance. Uh, because you, you go to it with this baggage. Yeah, so I just true. wondered how much of a baggage the painter uh, considers this uh, herself. Know, the only thing that bothers me is being labelled as a feminist, which I'm not. I think I'm a humanist primarily. Mm -hmm. And as I said, though I still paint a lot of women in the paintings, there have been areas that have been left untouched by people who look at the work, like a whole series of bowls that I did, mm -hmm. or this kind of quest we were talking of. Uh, which one is hesitant to label as I uh, use a lot of Buddhas in my work and Kabir I've done a whole series so I feel the uh, weightage has been more towards the women aspect rather than say works uh, I've been painting environmental issues for 11-12 years I think it's easy for people to just label you as one thing and then a woman painter is expected to paint you know like women writers are expected to have certain sentimental mm -hmm. issues regarding to women as their core theme mm -hmm. 
rather than being citizens of the world mm -hmm. or regarding the Amrita Shirkil question, I feel very proud because mm -hmm. she is one of my ideals, mm -hmm. so much so that I wanted to call myself Amrita mm -hmm. when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And my mother, she was, um, uh, she had a sort of distaste for the mm -hmm. prosaic sick names. Mm -hmm. So she never wanted to give me a name. Mm -hmm. I had an absurd name uh -huh. till I chose my own name at 15. Uh -huh. so and I wanted to, I will that <laughs> <should not be. laughs> So at the age of 15, I thought of Amrita. Uh -huh. And I was in Simla at that time, my last school. And I wrote to her that I did the ring between Amrita and Arpana because mm -hmm. Amrita, I mean, I, it's such a cross to bear mm -hmm. and it's too great and who the hell am I to name myself after mm -hmm. her. So I eventually out of that uh, self-consciousness of that great historical burden, mm -hmm. I chose Zarpana instead. I think I thought it would be a lesser burden to mm -hmm. carry. So that's the story mm -hmm. of the Amrita. You were uh, a, a student of literature in college and uh, you're mm -hmm. a self-taught painter. What does it mean to be a self-taught painter? You just pick up a canvas, buy some paint and try and figure it out? I think it's a matter of, um, you know, painting is not just mm -hmm. an act of applying paint on canvas. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, a whole philosophy of uh, life or uh, there's this flat surface in which you mm -hmm. have to create a vision. And I was never ever confident I'd ever make it as a professional painter. I knew of none in my immediate mm -hmm. surroundings. So I thought, let me do literature, teach mm -hmm. and do painting as a hobby. Mm -hmm. but while at college, this mm -hmm. ad came out that Hussein was selecting some young artists for a big show and that's how I entered mm -hmm. this field professionally. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there was very little mm -hmm. by way of professional, mm -hmm. uh, so it was a long road, mm -hmm. a long struggle. But um, I was deeply attracted to our uh, tradition of painting and sculpture. Mm -hmm. And the very first painting that I ever sold in my life, I bought an art book. Mm -hmm. And even now I give myself that present mm -hmm. with the result that I have a wonderful library of art books, mm -hmm. and especially of miniatures, and I keep going through them thousands of times mm -hmm. without getting tired. I take a lot of elements from our miniature mm -hmm. painting. There was a whole phase when I took a lot of architectural elements from 1980 to 85. Then after the riots, the series that I did took a lot of external elements of nature, setting the human tragedy against the vast backdrop of nature. You're referring to the, the, the sea crash. Yeah, the sea that's right, the riots, yeah. So all these elements of nature, the setting of the small human tragedy against the vast backdrop of nature and how nature continues. It was a series called World Goes On, which was shown here in Al Ghazi's gallery in 85 and then in Bombay and Calcutta. So all that was taken from the miniatures, which is from my vast collection of books. And even now I look at these books all the time and uh, get a lot of uh, inspiration from them. Then my issues are always contemporary. And I think that's what um, this learning process has been from one's own tradition rather than any Western imposed um, art education. So obviously, sort of, uh, you know, two aspects uh, to, to, to art. And, and, and one is a sort of uh, the, the craftswoman mm. aspect, uh, <coughs> where uh, you, you, you learn technique. Uh, so that you're able to express uh, as accurately and vividly mm -hmm. as you can the, 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 the internal visualizing and, and, mm -hmm. and, and that process. Um, how did you sort of acquire the, the, the craftsmanship uh, of painting uh, self-taught? Um, you know, for instance, if you need, um, there's one painting which was with Kushwan, women reading a newspaper. So that was done in 79 and a window open and how a woman is trying to read the world. And I made my mother hold a newspaper and I would draw her. Basically, it's riyas, so constant drawing. If you're sitting on a chair, somebody is reading in the house, uh, somebody is playing the violin, I'm constantly drawing. It's, it's a constant element of riyas. Then looking at your own tradition and the way the miniatures or a sculpture has taken liberties with the human figure, which Western art never dared to do. So we have taken certain liberties with the human figure that I learned from, or say the element of repetition in Buddhist painting, which gives a sense of ongoingness, you know. So these are, if you open your eyes and mind, uh, you know, there's so many things that you can learn from. And 
um, I feel that I, I, one lifetime is too short to implement all that one's absorbing and learning all the time and I wish I had 10 lives. Mm -hmm. Well, as someone who's sort of um, not even remotely an artist, you're always sort of envious, I am, <laughs> <laughs> of, 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 of people's ability uh, to be able to work with uh, form, color, shape and, and, and to create these visions. And, and you always wonder, uh, uh, what is it that, that uh, I lack? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what is, what, what, how can I make this happen? Uh, how can I translate sort of these, these intangible, sometimes incomprehensible urgings, tingling sensations in the body, anguish of the mind, sort of translate that into paper? So it's, or, or canvas or, or a mural. So it's always interesting to sort of try and, and, and get a sense of what is this process? Uh, that that. Uh, that that you know that, that that starts from somewhere in, in the recesses of the mind and then becomes a concrete reality. Uh, that's a wonderful, warm <laughs> question, and it's a, it's wonderful to hear. <laughs> Nobody's ever asked me in an interview, mm -hmm. but uh, painting is an in intoxication, like mm -hmm. all the creative arts must be. Mm -hmm. So it you start it because it gives you immense pleasure, and you start playing with forms and colors and. Um, in my case, I somehow feel that it's some unconscious thirst left over from previous births. Uh -huh. You know, some unquenchable thirst uh -huh. Uh -huh. that leads you to this path uh -huh. and that leads you on and on from one work to the uh -huh. other. Because in terms of, um, say, material uh, or uh, the other aspects that uh -huh. Uh -huh. creative work brings, uh -huh. my cup has been full for a long, long, long time. Uh -huh. Then what is that thirst? that uh, undefinable thirst, mm -hmm. surely it's some residue which mm -hmm. of some unconscious thing mm -hmm. that one's not aware of. Mm -hmm. But it's also, you know, color is a very intoxicating mm -hmm. factor. Mm -hmm. And the way people get their cake out of this evening drink, you know, mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. like us, mm -hmm. we have to start our day with, um, with color. color. <laughs> <laughs> color. <laughs> so it's just mm -hmm. a personal necessity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, becomes an individual language if you're lucky because so many embark on this mm -hmm. on this personal necessity this thirst mm -hmm. is so many people's mm -hmm. if you have some kind of support mm -hmm. to begin with in your most difficult years some moral psychological mm -hmm. more important financial support mm -hmm. from a parent mm -hmm. you can go on otherwise you're finished you know you just dry up and wither so Obviously, there's a balance because frequently we associate great art with great suffering. Why is that? Uh, the suffering, <laughs> you know, remains because uh -huh. this thirst is unquenchable. Uh -huh. You know, no amount of um, uh -huh. uh, work that you've produced or rewards it may bring uh, can quench it because uh, you feel, oh my God, your time is running out. You have so many images in your head and there's so much to say. Um, I mean, the rewards of it are, it's great freedom. You're not painting for a market. Mm -hmm. You're not. Well, you're not, but I think a great deal of art is painting for a market. Um, <laughs> yes, it's, it's again a uh, necessity uh -huh. of the individual artist that he may churn out work, because now there's a great market for a great number of artists. We know that. But while you're in the solitude of your, of your studio, the word exhibition or market does not come to your mind. It's mm -hmm. totally, it's another, it's mm -hmm. akin to the most spiritual of experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's only later that the other paraphernalia, as I said earlier, take you over. You mentioned this aspect spiritual uh, a number of times in our conversation. Uh, is it that uh, our tradition of art, because historically has been uh, spiritual and, and, and motivated by the, the religious imperative, has been more imitative uh, and, 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 and replicating than it has been an expression of uh, one's inner uh, urgings, anguish, striving, fulfillment? Um, I don't know, art I've always seen as a spiritual exercise, whether it was a sculptor's mm -hmm. second century BC, the Yaksh Yakshis, or a Janta Elora, or the miniatures. I think that uh, it was always, otherwise, why would one choose it when there's so many other parts to? Mm -hmm choose from? Uh, why would one choose it? Because of this inner necessity or a gift given by God that you are an instrument in his hands. So you are doing things uh, 
as a medium, as an instrument. You know, when I did this Hamburg mural, which is a five-story high building, I have a great fear of heights. And I was up there on the scaffolding, not daring to look down. And I, all through the experience of painting it, having completed it, I thought it was not me. I mean, I didn't realize how it got done. And uh, it was a lot of hard work. I was up there from morning till night. But it was one really felt like an instrument. And you, firstly, to begin with, you just felt like you're putting a stamp of India on a German ball. Mm -hmm. That was the main motive of going there, that here's a public space where thousands pass. It's a shopping complex in Hamburg. And thousands of people are going to see this predominantly Indian work, because Winke let me have my way. Mm -hmm. The predominant motif in it is the Varli spiral mm -hmm. from the folk art in Maharashtra of the continuous dance of life. Mm -hmm. And it's the Eastern concept of time, mm -hmm. a goddess, a lotus, a pot uh, full of water, pot being a metaphor for the body, all these rounded objects uh, juxtaposed with the linear scale and compass that Zwinke painted. So uh, firstly, the necessity was of just putting a stamp of your culture. And this wall, I'm told, is going to last at least 20 years. You've believed in, in, in the cycles of life and rebirth and, yes. and, and the many uh, landmarks as you look back on your, on your work and on your life. Uh, but when you sort of look ahead, um, are there sort of uh, signposts, landmarks that you're reaching out to or striving to? Or have you been able to achieve total surrender to the processes of life? A surrender to the process. Total surrender. I don't think much ahead. I don't know what the next day will bring. So I like living from day to day. And every day in the morning, it's a fresh new birth. Because you know you're tackling this area in your canvas. Like today before the interview, I'm working in a series called Sony, from the Sony Maiwal series. So I was trying to tackle a net that Mahiwal is casting upon Sony. Mm -hmm. And she's sitting like this, calm in the water, mm -hmm. and he's casting this net. Mm -hmm. And that's what, so every day brings its surprises. Mm -hmm. How to handle that net without making it literal, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because that's the danger also, that things should not become mm -hmm. too literal when you're saying mm -hmm. something, because painting has its own mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. And the mystery must remain in the work, not everything should be As should it be must said. in life. Arpana Kaur, thank you very much. That we, we were delighted that we managed to penetrate the answering machine and that you've been here with us. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Raj. It's such a pleasure and thank a privilege you. for thank me, you. believe me. Thank you.